Carlos. So he asks the question, what are these, my Lord? He doesn't give the answer, nor will I. So he's marveling over the message. Now let's look at the summary statement of the message in verse 6. So he doesn't specifically say what the significance of the two olive trees are, but he does say to him, this is the word of the Lord on the Cerubim. So what this is conveying is a message from God, an inspired message, and it centers on these phrases that this works Zerubbabel. You, go, you want to build a temple, you want to serve God, you want to accomplish something for the glory of God. It's not going to be done by might. It will not be done by military power. It will not be done for the army, the Marines, whatever the new branch is called, whatever branch, it will not be accomplished through might, through military strength. And then he says, it will not be done by power. You can have all the money in the world. You cannot build a work of God if the spirit of God's not involved. You can throw all the money you want into a work, but if the spirit of God's not in it, it won't get done. It won't get done. You can have all the people in the world working together in, in, in a building of whatever, church, whatever. And if, it, in the, if it's a divorce from the spirit of God, it will not be a work that brings glory to God. So regardless of what military strength or numbers of people or financial resources, he is saying here, it's not going to be done. The work of God will not start, develop, and be finished in these ways. But it will be accomplished by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That's powerful. So we believe God's omnipotent. We believe he can give us power. So now we're asking God, the Holy Spirit, we're asking the triune God, and especially the Spirit of God, would you fill me? Will you fill me? You indwell me already at conversion. Will you fill me? Will you control me? Will you empower me? Will you work through me? And I'm going to depend upon the Spirit of God to do the work of God. I'm not going to depend upon my, my resources, power, might. I'm not going to depend upon my personality. I'm not going to depend upon my education. I'm not going to depend upon my whatever. I'm going to need to depend on the Spirit of God. So as we go to serve God, we say, say God, empower me. May the Spirit of God fill me. May this work be done by you, God. Work through me to do your will and your good pleasure. So a very, very powerful central message here being given in verse 6. Now, what's encouraging here is in verse 7, he continues to say, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. So what we have here is some, a very, very vivid picture. So here's Zerubbabel, the governor, civil leader, leading the building program, the temple. It's stalled. And before Cerubal is a, is a 14er, this monster, this monster mountain. And that mountain represents what? It represents problems. It represents a heavy workload. It represents obstacles. It represents difficulties. It, it represents things that get in the way. So here's a guy who's not sleeping well, a guy who is discouraged, hope deferred, makes the heart sick. He is heart sick. And all he sees, his eyes are on the mountain rather than on the creator of the mountain, whence cometh our help. His eyes are on the mountain, all the problems, list of problems. And right now, you're going to go out into this week and you've got plenty of problems. There's a mountain staring at you. And the imagery here is God is able to take that mountain of problems and level it and just make it a plane. And when God helps you work through your problems where it moves into a plane, that transition from this really heavy load to this light yoke is a time for us to say, God, thank you for empowering me. Thank you for enabling me. And the only way I could get all this done is, is because of your grace. And I can say unto you, grace, grace unto the projects. It was by your grace that this mountain came down and these things got accomplished. So it's not like Shrubal says, oh, I accomplished this wonderful building program. And it's all about me. No, it's not. It was all about the spirit of God working through him where he could say grace, grace to God. It's all about the grace of God. So let's just think about the riches for a moment. Church plant. 
At his age? Are you kidding? That poor feeble old man. I mean, what is he thinking? He said church planning is a young man's game. I'm not so sure it is anymore. I used to think that. I watch the young guys go out and make a mess of things. I'm saying maybe it's not a young man's game. Maybe it's an old man's game. Maybe it's an old man working with a young man. Maybe the best combination. But a church plant starting <laughs> from scratch? Uh, we're not a denomination. Uh, he just doesn't put in a, you know, an application or a, a PO or whatever and say, just can you order me all these pieces and we're going to start a church? No, it's right from the beginning, scratch, ground zero. Build a church. That's pretty overwhelming. That's a lot of work. That's a big mountain. At the same time, <laughs> they're starting a new family business, a, a music school. They're right, right in conjunction uh, with their church planning uh, desires. So how many of you have started a, a business? How, how, how's that working for you? Is it easy? Is it easy to do that in Colorado? The paperwork, just the mountain of paperwork. The, the, just the process to rent a facility and then modify the facility to match what your goals are with your startup company, music in this case, Music Academy. That's a big mountain. That's overwhelming. He showed me pictures of the building they're looking at. Beautiful really strategically located, works well together with his business and with the, with the possible church plant working in whatever parts of these buildings. But Colin also has a day job. He has a day job. Your day job, what's it take for you to do your day job? You say, well, my day job kind of leans into a day and night job. Yeah, I get it. And you got your own set of problems with your day job. So you got your day job and its mountains. You got a church plant and its mountains. You're starting a, a music academy and, and those mountains. A daughter going to a new school, other special needs and issues, things we don't even know of, a mission commitment to Myanmar and to the fine men over there. All I see is this monster mountain of responsibilities. <laughs> and you say, how are you going to do it? How's Colin going to do it? How's Katie going to do it? How are they going to do it? How do you do it? How does anyone do it? It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's through the spirit of God. And guess what happens when we lean on the spirit of God to get the work done? At the end of the day, people say, how did you do it? You say, well, grace, grace, son, <laughs> it's just the grace of God. And, and I don't get the credit, but God gets the glory. It was his spirit working through me, through his grace and through the power of the spirit of God. And look what he did for his glory, for his namesake. Very, very, very powerful. So Zerubbabel, <laughs> you know, you see this great mountain. And it's going to become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone, the capstone thereof, with shouting. So here's the point. Serubabel had a clear call to start this building project. Clear as, the, you know, just clear. Clear call from God. His question was, am I going to finish the thing? Am I going to finish the thing? And now in this text, he has the promise that he will finish the building, and he will put the capstone on it. So this is incredible, called to start it, but also now promised by God that he'll finish it. Oh, that must have been extremely encouraging. I think the only you know, way we're sustained in ministry and serving God is through the spirit of God and through the promises of God. You know, if we're going to go forward and do a work for God, you've got to be in the word of God and you cling to the promises because behind the promise is the power of God. So now he can say, Lord, I don't know how it's going to get done other than by your grace, but you've, you've called me to build it, and by your grace, <laughs> for your spirit, we're going to see the project finished. Man, that must have been so, so encouraging, especially facing the fact that he's looking at four mountain peaks on that one mount, monster mountain. There are four peaks on that thing that he has to overcome to bring it down, down to a plane. What are those mounts? You have here Mount St. Heaven. Look at that big mountain that's got to come down. You have a government now that once approved the building of the temple. Now they've reneged. Now you have the government saying, we are the powers there be, and you can't build it. Well, so much for that idea. God's going to build it regardless of the civil authorities' desire to control this group of people. Uh, but Mount Heathen can be, Mount St. Heathen can be a real challenge in this day and age. Uh, starting a church, the government hindrances, 
the opposition within the state, even persecution. Do you not think when I preach the word of God, that if you deal with some of the social issues of this day in the state of Colorado, that, that could be a problem? Do you think that could be a problem? When you have a governor married to another man, that can be a problem. You speak out on that topic, that could actually be a problem. So uh, is the government, the powers there be? Oh, they have powers, but it comes from God. <laughs> if they have authority, it comes from God. And so here he's got to deal with all, all these issues of oppression and opposition and resistance from outside. He's got to climb, he's got to see this mountain come down with the peak, Mount uh, St. Heathen. There's another challenge here. They've already done this before. They tried to build this before. One of the most discouraging things in work is where you start something and you're all gung-ho and people are excited and then it comes to a stall for years. And now you got to get folks revved up and motivated. Hey, let's go back to project, the big vision. We've got to rebuild this thing or try it again when you've already failed. So that's, that's difficulty. Mount past failure. That's a hard thing to overcome. In ministry, if you've had any challenges and setbacks and hurts, the, the mind in the flesh and add Satan to it at times will say, you can't do this. You failed before, or you're going to run into a chainsaw of horrible people. Why would you submit yourself to this? Why would you want to be in ministry again? When we met the Richards, it wasn't like they were jumping up and down. They'd come out of full-time ministry, a lifetime of ministry. And Colin said, I'm not so sure I want to be back in ministry vocationally like this. And his model right now is kind of a hybrid model, a tent-making tent model. But my hat goes off to you to want to keep serving God. And I tell you, kids of pastors who see the hurts and the ugliness of people, those kids are also tempted. Why would I want to be a Christian? Why would I want to be in church? Why would I want to serve God? Want to see all the monkey business? So my hat goes off to you girls. You've been strong. You follow dad and mom. That's a good thing. You're a good parent. You don't quit. And you keep your eyes upon Jesus. And you will always keep the right perspective then in your heart, in your mind. So Mount past failure, wow, wow, wow. And then uh, we'll get to Mount Puny in a moment. But I think the, the only thing that this guy can put his hat on, okay, God called me to do it, and now he's made it clear that I'm going to finish it. So what projects are you working through that you see a mountain between it and a plane that you know it needs, the, the problems need to come down, you need to get it done, and you're discouraged? Uh, I've got a friend, his kids say, dad's a great, you know, he can do so many things physically around the house, but he only gets only so far on the projects. And they tease their dad. They say, our house is a halfway house. I said, really? That's my house. I got projects everywhere that aren't complete. I'm living in a halfway house, my poor wife. If I didn't have Dick Fos and others like him to come over and finish the things I don't finish, we, have, we would have a really good halfway house. Okay. So what halfway projects? For us, we have a list of things. You know, I, I have four books I'm working through right now at various stages. Four books. One's a daily devotional on mountains. I have a, a morning and evening the uh, articles I'm submitting. The, the first one is Mountains Through the Bible. Mountains Through the Bible. I think it's going to be an interesting study. Every day, you know, for 365 days of mountain stories. And then in the evening, uh, this day in mountain history. So I've got all the research done. 365 stories on what happened on each day of the year. But to put this all together, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? My wife's writing a book right now. She's at the halfway point in her book. I mean, she's right smack in the middle. And I'm saying, honey, well, hopefully our life will get back to whatever normal is. And you need to keep writing. You need to finish. Here's this mountain. There's a lot of obstacles keeping you from writing, but you need to finish. How about college? Some of you are freshmen. You're saying, I'll never finish. <laughs> Senior year looks so far away. Grad school, forget it. That looks so far away. What a mountain in view. Some of you who completed it, you say, thank the Lord, grace, grace unto it. I graduated by the grace of God. He provided for me. You finished it. Right now at Camp Grace, speaking of grace, grace unto it, we have a project right now. I don't want to go up this week. I'll stare at it. Uh, I'll, I'll drive the ladies. I delight to do that. I'll meet with Marlon, and we're going to go out by the maintenance building. There's a big hole in the ground, big hole in the ground right at the maintenance building. That's a $48,000 hole. 
$48,000 hole. It's a well, it's a well. We thought it'd be $25,000. We had to go deeper and hit water, have a water we needed to put out the pressure we needed. We paid for it, we had the money. But uh, there's not much money left in the, in the treasury. We could do much more. The summer, the summer camps, we just had enough to work through it. And right next to that well, there's, other, there's a huge line in the ground. It's where the infrastructure is. So we have nearly a million dollars of infrastructure. We have work and materials you'll never see. It's all underground. Can you imagine that? All the plumbing and all the power and all the lines and all the development, it's all underground. You don't see it, we won't appreciate it, but you had to do it, you can't go forward. And there's a big power line right there in the water line going up to the drainage field for the septic system. And then right next to it is, is a huge pile, maybe the size of maybe the first six pews here, and it's the wood, it's the wood, it's the wood package that's been shipped to the camp. And in that package, are poles, it's a pole building, a modified house using a, a pole building kind of structure. Some of you guys know what that means. You've done it with barns or garages. So we're doing something very creative as inexpensively as we can to put up the first house since the fire. And so there's the ditch, <laughs> there's another ditch, and there's a pile of wood. Everything you need to build the, the structure of that house. It's all in that pile, it's all right there. So who's going to do it? Are you going to do it? And when you put it up, you, you, need, to, you need to put electric in it. You need to put the, you rough in the plumbing and then you've got to put sheetrock up and you've got to paint and you've got to do all that. And you start, you know, adding those line items, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. So how much is that? That's 83,000 more dollars. And we're staring at a mountain, staring at a pile of wood and saying, Lord, how is that house going to be built? And all I can say is, Lord, by your grace, it will be built. By your power, for your spirit, it will be built. And you may be staring at your mountains, and we all have them. If they're going to come down to a plane and be accomplished, those projects, it will only be by the grace of God and through the spirit of God. It's a beautiful picture here. So he says here in verse 10, you have the third mount here, Mount Puny. <laughs> So we have Mount St. Heath and part of that mountain that we're looking at, and Mount Past Failure and Mount Puny. Look at the phrase, for who hath despised the day of small things? Who hath despised the day? Who's looked down upon a church plan? Why are you doing this? You have a family of five that's starting it, really? Do you realize there's 715,522 people in Denver? Five people, ha ha, really? That's pretty puny. Uh, Metro Denver today, 2.97 million people. Five people, 10 people, 12 people, pff, puny. Our state, 5,773,714 counting our new neighbors. It's a lot of people. Five people, 20 people, drop in the bucket. And unnoticeable. Why would you do these things? Why are you leaving a good thing here? Why are you doing this or that? And people look down at the, at the day a small beginnings, they criticize it, they make fun of it, they can make comparisons. What had hurt this building project initially was the older generation put a wet blanket, they rained on the parade. The people who had survived the captivity, who could remember the first temple, Solomon's temple, were saying, as they saw the new foundation built, they're saying, this is, this is nothing compared to the old temple. This is nothing. You know, it can be discouraging to the next generation when they hear old people talk about the good old days and, you know, God did things in the past and he's not doing them today. And we have these revivals and God can't do that today. And, and young people say, wow, maybe God can't do that. Maybe God isn't as powerful as we, we think theologically and systematically. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. I, I love the story of a, a teenager by the name of Charlie. <laughs> he was invited to preach the New Park Street Chapel, in the morning. The kid went in, his, his, his suit dirty, soiled, not pressed, wrinkled, a handkerchief with polka dots hanging out of it, 
kind of like the ones Colin wears. Um, that's a mean poke. I do like your little hankies. Are they call them hankies? What are they called? This guy has this thing dangling out. Hair's not combed. Hair's not combed. And people are poof. Really? Who invited this guy? And Charles Spurgeon that morning preaches. To a small crowd, that church had 313 people on the membership roster. There was only a few people there, less than tonight. Just a few people. And here's Spurgeon, and he preaches that morning. This kid, he's not even 20 yet, he's a kid. And the people heard that sermon. He stood back and said, whoa, we got to get this kid. So that afternoon, every single person that was there, they made, not phone calls, this is 1800s. They ran to their neighbor. They went to members who weren't at church, people who weren't in the choir, and people who were not in the orchestra. And they went out and said, you need to come to church tonight and hear this kid preach. You will not believe it. You don't want to miss it. And don't despise this young buck. You need to hear him preach. And that night, the place was not packed, but had quite a large crowd. And in that crowd was a little girl. Her name was Susie. Susanna Thompson. Susanna Thompson came that night. She laughed in her spirit when she saw all this this ragamuffin in the pulpit. Later, she'd marry that man and help straighten some of those things out. In the first six and a half years of his ministry there at the Park Street Chapel, it grew from just a few people to 1,442 active members that he personally had interviewed for membership. Over 1,000 of them, he had led the Christ who was preaching and work and had baptized them. He built a church on the gospel and on converts, not transferred growth from other churches. Over a thousand converts were part of that new membership. You know, my prayer for, for Brother Colin as he goes forth into a very unique mission field is that you'll see souls saved, you'll see him baptized and added unto the church, Acts 2.42 pattern. And then from there, the church could not hold that crowd. They transitioned to the, to the Metropolitan Tabernacle and he humbly would write, not too many years later, he said, we are the largest Baptist church in England. What he didn't know, he was the largest non-Catholic church in the world, in the world. And it started off so, so insignificantly small. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Wow, what a mountain this guy, Zerubbabel, is looking at. Verse 10, for they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet, the plummet, the plumb line. And the hand of Cerebral, what he's saying here, we're gonna, you're going to get back to work. You're going you're to finish the job. You're going to say grace, grace unto it. And, and the reason you're going to be able to do this is for the spirit of God's power. And you have the, the eyes of God on this work. Where you see those seven, those seven, they're the eyes of the Lord. The idea of his complete and perfect vision of all these things. God watches our work. And sees our work wherever we go and is more interested in our work than we are. What a promise. What a statement made there. So this brings us to our conclusion. Verse 11, then answered I. <laughs> okay, you didn't answer my question. I, thank you for all the encouragement. But what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? What's the significant, what's the symbolic value of the two olive trees? because the whole vision rests upon those two sources. So the answer now comes, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? They answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? He said, yeah, you get it. I don't know. I want to know what is the significance of the two olive trees. And finally, the answer comes out. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. That's your answer. And you're saying, well, that's rather unsatisfactory. I get it. I can read that. So let's interpret it. So in the book of Zechariah, there are two men under this project who are anointed with oil to serve in their office. It's the governor, the civil leader, Serubable. 
And the other person leading this building project is the high priest Joshua back in chapter three. Those are the two anointed ones who are running the operation in this time period. Okay? Are they the two olive trees? Hardly. You, you, you want your work to be sourced by a sinner, a fallen man, even though he's a high priest or a governor. You, you, don't, you want a better source than that. So what is the significance of the two olive trees? If they're not a, a, a priest and a high priest and a governor, then what is the significance of the two anointed ones? When you study through the book of Zechariah in chapter six, there's an incredible statement made about the Messiah, Mashiach, Jesus. Verse 13, even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. There are two anointed ones, two anointed offices, high priest and king. And those two human figures that were working and doing the building project pictured, pictured typology pointed to one person, one person wearing two hats, you could say. And that one person would be Jesus Christ, who is anointed high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's not from the tribe of Levi. He's from Judah. So he's a high priest under another unique order, the distinct order, but he's also an anointed king. And in the Old Testament, you could not be an anointed king, an anointed priest. Those two offices, you kept distinct. So here are these two trees. They are pointing to the two offices that would be held by the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. If that is accurate, it gives you insight into the two witnesses. One of those two witnesses in the tribulation will be a civil leader, like a Zerubbabel, and the other one will be a religious leader, uh, like a Joshua, the high priest, or like a Moses and Elijah, or whatever combination you want to put together, but it, it is sharing something, because those two men in the tribulation also typologically are pointing to Jesus, who is prophet, who is priest and king, who's coming soon to start a kingdom. And there's a council of peace between those two offices. There's no contradiction between them. So let's just plug this into the equation, and we'll finish. So this tree and this tree points to Jesus, king and priest. And from God, from God the Son in this case, and we would, could add the Father, but context is God the Son, he is the source. He's the one who sent the Spirit to indwell Christians, in fact. And so he is the source for ministry. And the process is seen where he gives the oil, gives the Spirit of God to fuel the lampstand. The lampstand is the people of God. So you've got a divine source who's using a divine person to enable us to be the light of the world. What possibly could go wrong there? What possibly could go wrong? The only thing that could go wrong there is if the pipes get clogged, if the oil doesn't get to us. But in this case, it looks really good. Really good oil, golden divine pipes. So it's a beautiful picture that we in our work really is to be empowered by the triune God and each person of the Trinity has a part in our ministry to do the work, to see the mountains come down to a plain, and when those projects get done, grace, grace to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this section of scripture. We pray for the Richards especially that this passage would have even greater significance as they work forward on dealing with these mountains, bringing them down to a plain by your grace and through your spirit. We thank you that our work is ultimately sourced by the almighty God of the universe, the source and the means. And so, Lord, we thank you for your grace. May we do your will. And when we accomplish things for your glory, may it be like a tree of life. And may we say grace, grace to it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, I'd like to just take a moment here when we talk about the Lord's Supper. I can't help but think every time we do the Lord's Supper to think of Christ instituting it. He knew when he instituted it with those men in that upper room, 
he knew the next day he was dying. He, he knew and this was part of a kind of a farewell meal, a farewell address. Oh, he would be with them. And he said he would come again. He'd set up a kingdom and they would fellowship with him. And there's that there's future promises of the Lord. But in the background of this story of, of the institution of the Lord's Supper on that Passover meal, from that Passover meal, wow. Well, it's a very, very rich context. Uh, tonight, I think the fellowship that we enjoy as a church um, is very rich. We're very blessed. To have people leave to serve God, that's a blessed thing too. And uh, as believers, we, we don't say goodbye for the last time, especially folks who live locally. I think we should play golf. I think we should get together and pray. I think we should serve God. We'll have Richards here uh, certainly again and again, as the Lord wills. But uh, this is a special night. It's a special night for us to fellowship. It's a special night to be thankful to God. And it all comes down to Christ, really. Uh, he obeyed the will of his Father. He came, died on that cross. He gave his all was buried. That wonderful act of sacrifice was vindicated uh, by the Father. He accepted the sacrifice of the Son, vindicated his Son by raising him from the dead. Uh, that's quite a sign of approval that the sacrifice accomplished what it was intended to do, where our sins were paid completely by him. So I think it'd be appropriate tonight for us to take a few moments to thank our Lord for salvation, what he's done for us, and the, one of the benefits of that is we have friends that are Christians, friends that are part of the family of God. That's really special. And there are times where your best friends and your best family members may not be biological. That's how it works sometimes, where your best friends are fellow Christians. They're our family in the sense of biology, DNA, but they're your friends. And I'm so thankful for our friendships here. And uh, Brother Colin, we thank you for the friendship that we've enjoyed and we can tease you and love you and work with you and just I'll be blessed by you. It's been a good run, been a good run. We look forward to seeing what the Lord's going to do through his grace. This evening, each of you should have received uh, this. If you have not um, picked up a cup uh, with a wafer, does anyone not yet have one? You slipped in? Yes. Luce needs one here in the front. Uh, Brother Dick, right in the front here. So Luce, keep your hand up. Uh, can you raise your hand, please? Uh, Luce, Luce. Hey, Luce. We love you so much. <laughs> You're so much fun to tease. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, each time I participate in Lord's Supper, when I think of the bread, I think of the body uh, that was broken for us there on the cross. And uh, the bread's are a, a great picture uh, of, of the Lord, the bread of life, and that we can have a relationship with him by, by appropriating his work of redemption through faith in Christ. So let's uh, take out of our package here the bread for a moment. Work there. Pick that up. If you're like me, if you open up the cup side first, the, the fruit side, that's a problem. Can anyone else do that? <laughs> I think we're very close to transitioning back to handing things out. We're really close. Uh, but I'm glad that. Uh, through the COVID issues, we've had these little units. Uh, they're very, very helpful. But if you would, if you take the bread, just a moment, and uh, just let's each reflect upon the Lord and thank him in our hearts that he died for us, that he died for us, and uh, paid for our sins, all of them, every single one. Would you bow for prayer and meditate on what the Lord has done for you? It's important for us to seek the Lord tonight. Make sure that we have a pure heart. Make sure that we have confessed our sins. We've asked him to search our hearts to see if there be anything that's amiss in our relationship with the Lord. And so would you just take a few moments here to just seek the Lord and to pray and to thank him and to love him.
Heavenly Father, thank you for our service tonight that we can look into your word and see Christ, the anointed high priest and king of kings. We're so thankful that there's no conflict between those offices held by him. He's the only worthy one in all of history to be able to wear both the, the priestly turban and the kingly crown. We thank you for his death on the cross. We thank you for this institution, this ordinance of the Lord's Supper to help us remember and keep our focus upon your son and what he did for us. Lord, thank you so much for forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Grace, grace unto it when we talk about our salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us take and eat in remembrance of him. You also have the uh, fruit of the vine, the symbol for the blood of Christ. And you're holding that. Each of us go for our own, our own processing when we worship the Lord. Um, I try uh, especially to envision Jesus sitting upon his throne right now. So he is in heaven at the summit, at the highest point, high and lifted up above the cherubim. <clears throat> He's uh, being worshipped by the angelic host. <clears throat> He's being worshipped by the redeemed of all the ages that are currently with him. And then we participate in worshipping him from earth. And so I, I view him on the cross, uh, viewing our service, looking at us, those seven eyes with his omnipotence and his omniscience. And he beholds us and this pleases him when we worship him on his terms and his conditions. On a personal note, I, uh, when I take the uh, fruit of the vine, uh, I'm thinking of this just a week ago was Mary Vos's birthday. She celebrated it again um, in heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so if Mary, I'm not choked up, I'm dying. <clears throat> um, glass of water maybe might help. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> Stephen, I got that point. Thank you. <clears throat> Much better. Thank you. So I was thinking of Mary, we were talking one time, we were fellowshipping, and uh, we were talking about the Lord's Supper, and she says, what do you think on, you know, when you do that? And I said, well, for me, when it comes to the fruit of the vine, I, I said, it's hard for me not to think about my life before a Christian, that I used to hold the wine in my hand and get drunk, or hold the beer in my hand and get drunk, or the whiskey in my hand and get drunk, or whatever, to get drunk. And usually associated with those choices I was making then, it was usually words that were blasphemous or using the Lord's name in vain. And I, I, I told Mary, I said, I, I do think of that. I think of my past life. And then I think of what, what, what Christ has done and the difference he's made by his blood being shed that um, we can be cleansed from all sin. And so when I heard, hold the fruit of the vine in, in, in the Lord's Supper, I'm thinking, wow, I know what I used to hold in my motivations in life then. And now, wow, I'm a Christian now. I'm a Christian. Forgiven because of the blood of the Lamb. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I think that nearly every time we have the Lord's Supper, Lord, I'm holding this in my hand. And I know how I used to hold this in my hand, the fruit of the vine in ways that were self-destructive and really evil. And now, wow, we can hold the symbol pointing to the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sin. I'm thinking on that. I'm thinking on that. What are you thinking on? Let's just take a few moments to think on our, our wonderful Savior who's forgiven us of all of our sins because of his grace, grace, grace unto us, because of the blood of the Lamb that has washed those sins away and made us whiter than snow. Let's bow for prayer in a moment, but let's just meditate and thank the Lord for his forgiving power.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to focus upon this symbol that points to your son's blood. You know that life is found in the blood. We thank you that he gave his life blood for our redemption. Lord Jesus, we know that your word teaches us that you're sitting upon that beautiful throne, high and lifted up surrounded by a halo, a rainbow, pointing to the truth that your mercy endures forever. And because of that mercy, we're not consumed. Because of your grace, we've been given the gift of eternal life. And we're so thankful that we can enter into your presence even tonight and worship you. And Lord, there will be a day when we join the heavenly throng and that we will uh, be there in heaven with you. We will see you. And, and in the future, in our glorified state, we will see you face to face. And uh, we will acknowledge you and worship you as the Lamb of God. Thank you that we can have a little glimpse of heaven this evening. We thank you for, again, the forgiveness that's been granted. And I'm so thankful that uh, the lives that we live before conversion, all those sins, have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And I'm so thankful that you've done that for me and for each person here that knows you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let us take and drink in remembrance of him. Colin, I'm thinking, would you just take a moment to think, after the Lord um, instituted Lord's Supper, they did sing an Old Testament psalm, one of the Hallel Psalms, as a, as a group. And uh, those men had no idea what was coming down the pike, despite all the efforts of Jesus saying, I must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, but I'll be raised the third day. I'll be raised the third day. And it just, just went over those guys' heads, one after another. And yet he institutes that, they sing together. And he says, let's go. Let's, we're going to go up and take a little walk. And we're going to go up into the uh, Mount of Olives, uh, where they have the olive trees. Where they have the olive trees. And uh, we're going to spend a little time together there as well. We're going to pray. Now, what a night. What a night that must have been for those men to think back on. But we have a lot to think on. Would you like to lead us in a song? What would be your choice to see? What, what number or what song? Number 380, okay. Okay, that'd be fine. Let's stand together, 380. The Lord said we will be together again in the future. I'll drink new wine with you in the kingdom. I look forward to fellowshipping with you in the future, Lord Jesus. Okay, Brother Colin, would you come and close us in prayer? After he prays, we're going to work our way down to the gym. Uh, with some gifts we'd like to give to the family. There's a, a reception and some foods there that I want you to join us in and, uh, and have a time with Richard. So would you... Lead that, and can you play for us? Okay, all right, let's do it. Did you want to say anything after I picked on you all night? We good? I think I'm done. You sure? Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, all right, all right. No, thank you so much, Pastor. That that uh, set of verses is one of the most formative in my life and ministry, and I appreciate so much. Uh, you preaching those on our last night here. Hymn 380 on the third stanza, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. This is the new tune on Christ I Stand. When he 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dress in his righteousness alone, for blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful encouragement from your prophet Zechariah into the ears of some discouraged servants. And Lord, I pray now for Tri-City Baptist Church, as you have walked us through so many different challenges over the past several years, I pray, Lord, that you would fill this house with your spirit, that you would fill its people with strength and with courage and with boldness to proclaim the gospel throughout the communities that surround this church and throughout the world. And I thank you for the dear precious servants that you've placed in leadership, our pastor, the other pastors, the deacons, ask that you would just give them that humble spirit of dependence upon you in the days ahead. And that Lord, we would have the joy of continued fellowship right up until you come again in the clouds to meet us in the air. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>